from Hamster Wheel Publishing. This is Blunt Dissection. I'm Dave Nicholl. This episode of Blunt Dissection is brought to you by the CR7 Dental X-Ray System from the good folks at IM3. If you're doing dentistry and you're not using dental X-rays, then please listen up. A digital dental X-ray system will immediately improve not only your clinical decision making, but also your profit. How? Well, for the past 20 years, my clinical interest has been veterinary dentistry. Despite that expertise, when I visually inspect a pet's mouth and write up a dental chart, I find that after taking my x-rays, I've usually failed to identify 30% of the problems. Why? Because so much dental disease is hidden in the gum and is invisible to the naked eye, which means that without the x-rays, you and I are missing pathology. And pathology means you're not only leaving painful teeth in your patient, but also lots of money on the table. So if you're looking for a way to massively improve your patient outcomes and build a profitable business, then go to drdavenickel.com forward slash dental x-ray, drop the details into the form you find there, and one of the IM3 team will get in touch to arrange a demo. You will not be disappointed, I promise. In today's episode of Blunt Dissection, we talk to veterinary entrepreneur turned private equity financier, Garrett Turley. Garrett was one of the founders of Pet Doctors, which he grew in 1995 from a one-site clinic to becoming a 30-hospital behemoth stretching across the south coast of England. He successfully sold the business to CVS in a multi-million pound deal in 2011. Garrett now manages the London-based private equity investment fund run by Bridges Ventures focused on the healthcare and education spaces. In addition to his veterinary degree, which he gained at Cambridge University, he also holds an MBA. He got the MBA at Henley College of Management. Our conversation is wide-ranging and covers a lot of ground, including how an upbringing immersed in the sectarian violence of Northern Ireland helped motivate him to become a high performer. We also talk about where he sees the opportunities and the threats to veterinary industry coming from technology, corporate influence and the long overdue impact of female leadership. Garrett is a high octane but great fun person, so sit back and enjoy some awesome insights. And if Celtic accents are your thing, then you will most certainly not be disappointed by this episode. So Garrett, thank you very much for having me to uh, cloudy slightly overcast now is it arundel or is it arundel arundel and it's uh, my daughter will be very pleased to hear that because uh, obviously frozen they say arundel and we have many debates about how that should be pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter's four by the way so she's not like 40 or anything like <laughs> no, that. <laughs> that's always embarrassing <laughs> and she's uh she's she's very excited whenever i say i'm, I'm going over to arundel so i'm pleased i wasn't pronouncing that really bad apparently it comes from hirondel the french word for swallow so when they built the castle in the late 10 hundreds so one of the first castles built by the normans uh Irondel, um there were a lot of swallows around so they'd migrate and this would be one of the first places apparently in the so. uk they would apparently encounter so. so we're on the south coast of england here and um really pleased and um, grateful to spend a little time and pick your brain i'm not going to pick too hard but um <laughs> yeah so there's not much left please <laughs> be gentle <laughs> So, um, Garrett, I think probably a good place to start is just for, for um, those who aren't familiar um, with you, with your work, with your, your backstory, um, can you paint the sort of pastiche of your sort of early life and, and really sort of, you know, a view to, you know, how that then played itself out in your career up to now and what influences that had but just maybe paint a background because you've you've got a a journey that isn't typical shall we say yeah well i mean it's interesting that's an interesting question firstly because i've been reading a book recently called thinking fast and slow and one of the major points they make in that is when you look on your history and you tell your story actually you're telling the story as you see it rather than necessarily it happened so if there's anybody who's listening in and thinks that i'm absolutely lying through my teeth i'm not actually doing that i'm just telling the story as i've created it in my own delusional mind so excellent, i forgive me excellent pre-framing and <laughs> of lies I, I expect i say hashtag garrett's lying on twitter Anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hashtag fake news from Turley. <laughs> um, so, uh, so for anybody who's listening and wondering possibly why they think you're speaking to yourself because of our accents, <laughs> um, we are fellow Celts. And um, so I grew up in Northern Ireland. Uh, I come from a town called Newry, 
uh, was uh, grew up there in the 70s and uh, uh, early 80s. And so that was uh, pretty much when Northern Ireland was at the peak of its, uh, of its as we euphemistically called it, the Troubles, Troubles. which was yeah. all-out sectarian violence and um, a pretty tough time in Northern Ireland. I, uh, Newry is a post-industrial town, so... Uh, 25% unemployment was pretty common. Uh, it was uh, pretty run down yeah. um, and grey. And um, when I looked around as a kid, and I was very fortunate, I was, I'd, uh, my, I don't come from my, by any stretch of imagination to pride background, but uh, when I looked around, my father had, was first from his generation, uh, first from his family ever to get to university. He was very keen for me to obviously take that uh, ahead which is normal now but in northern ireland you have to remember back even in the 50s and 60s catholics were only really just allowed into universities at that point and i come from a catholic background so it was a big thing and education was the catholics way of escaping the sectarianism that was rife then and i'm pleased to say is not uh, by any stretch of the imagination uh, as prevalent now um and but I was, uh, so I grew up, I was very bright. Uh, unfortunately, again, red wine has dimmed that light. <laughs> but, but at the time I was. And um, I looked around and thought, what are, the, what are the jobs that I could do that uh, would be A, rewarding, and B, financially rewarding? And I, and I looked, and I had very limited imagination. That, in fact, has dogged me for my life. But I looked around and I saw doctors, maybe kind of dentist no 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 uh lawyers oh, yeah maybe uh and vets and a friend of mine's father was a vet uh he lived in a lovely house he seemed to have a fantastic job i was watching all creatures great and small the curse of many of us and um and also it it looked like a challenge uh in as much as it required the top grades and uh so there was an element of vocation in it, of course, uh, but that's what drove me uh, to to vet medicine, I suppose. And interestingly, um, I grew up in, as I, you know, in this in this uh, environment where there were there I mean great things about Northern Ar- the Northern Irish people, and and I'm very very strongly Northern Irish, even though I haven't lived there for thirty something years. And I've carried that sense uh, with me. And when I came to to the UK to go to university, uh, and something that's driven me through my career is a sense of proving to everybody that actually the stereotypical uh, vision that people have of a of an Irishman or woman is not true, and that uh, intellectually, commercially emotionally whatever it is yeah. we are uh, uh as as good if not better than everybody else out there <laughs> clearly better and i i um I, I went to glasgow university and and so it's interesting to chart your journey because we, we had a lot of northern irish um uh not just in the vet school but at the university like uh, i think i was the only scottish guy playing in the the uni ones there was like 30 northern irishmen one yeah. englishman and you know it was like a token scot yeah. um and so it was fascinating to see people coming over there and that was at the tail end you know that sort of you know 97 was just around the corner and and tony blair and you know mo molem you know famously yeah. sort of i was it calling ian paisley babe i think yeah or, that's right yeah, yes and, indeed gosh yes and 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 so that sort of you could tell talking to the um, to my classmates coming across that they seemed glad to be at university away from the troubles, um, but also massively proud. But you also then saw um, groups of Northern Irish people coming together at university across any sectarian divide that, that maybe they wouldn't have done so much back home. And, and everyone said, you know, home was how everybody described it there. You chose to go to. I'm imagining there weren't an absolute boatload of um, of people from Northern Ireland, and particularly Catholic upbringing in Northern Ireland. I'm Catholic as well, my upbringing, though not really <laughs> yeah, indeed, exactly. terribly religious. <laughs> um, 
but that's a that's not that's a, a less trodden path and another thing i've heard you mention before is this chippiness this concept of chippiness oh absolutely and that's sort of what you're i think that's what you're getting at that's there. very much it yes what was the driving decision on to was that what drove you to choose cambridge as a vet school or was that what was the motivation to take that pathway because that would seem like a like I say, possibly the hardest pathway that, that given the background that you could do. You- yes. Uh, yeah, no, it's, I think chippiness is, is how, I mean, look, I'm turning 50 this year and it's, it's both a, a curse and a blessing uh, to be chippy and I've held it all the way through. And when I, when I was at school, there were people at school who were, who were definitely brighter than me. In fact, one guy I was at school with who, who in fact, went to Dublin, became a vet, yep. brightest guy. I, I know I've gone to university, I've worked in various places and, and still he rates as one of the brightest guys, just didn't work hard. And uh, <laughs> where I was uh, a diesel chugging away. Yep. And um, interestingly, I went to my careers. My father said to me, have you considered Cambridge? I went to a careers teacher and said, I'm thinking of going to Cambridge. And he literally laughed at me and uh, wouldn't let me apply. And of course, being chippy. <laughs> red, red, right, <laughs> oh, red right to have, well, honestly. <laughs> and so nobody from our school had ever uh, managed to get into Cambridge. Yep. And, I, and my view was because they'd gone dark, they'd taken the wrong strategy. That was my view. <laughs> and, uh, and there were people much, much uh, more intelligent than I who'd failed because they'd taken the wrong strategy. So I had a different strategy. So what was the wrong strategy? The, the, wrong, strategy? the wrong strategy, as I saw it, was doing further maths at level, which <laughs> the teachers couldn't teach. So nobody, no, nobody was able to get a good result in it. So I went to Cambridge and... Uh, and I was I'm really lucky. I went. I found myself in a college at Cambridge that split into this college system, with a very supportive um, tutor. Yep. Um, and I actually had set myself a challenge when I was. I, I went there, but I was a year younger than everybody else. So yep. through school, I was. I was. Um, so there's the the next you know layer of uh, the yeah. chippy onion. Yeah, it's exactly. Layered on top. Exactly. So I, I got there when I was seventeen. And f- just totally immature. Yep. You know, you look at boys now and sort of, me- I mean, I'm thinking I'm getting to maturity. I haven't quite made it, but uh, yeah, it's just been, it's been a long journey. And, um, but when, when I got there, I had set myself, f- basically the target was get to Cambridge and yep. then it was actually do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and I certainly achieved the latter. <laughs> I really did. And, um, and so got involved in sports did comedy, did, um, gosh, what else did I do? Did a lot of debating, um, did far, far too much socializing, stroke drinking, um, and certainly didn't apply myself to my studies I've, at all. I've heard it described by close friends as, you know, there's two, there's two different kinds of people at university, and there's the people who go there to get grades and, you know, if they get less than 80, 85% in the exam or kind of, you know, they're in, inconsolable. And then there's the people like my group of friends who f- we felt like if we got 51%, we'd yeah. done 1% too much. <laughs> that, that, and, I, and I certainly <laughs> fell into that camp. And in fact, I actually rarely got to 51%. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, there's a few times of yeah. you know, parasitology and 20, uh, 29% it was yeah, like... Yeah. And yeah. in fact, my, my first tutorial report from, I think it was my physiology professor, said, um, uh, Garrett is uh, struggling in particular areas of this subject, uh, certainly those that require intelligence. Which <laughs> <laughs> damning, damning. Ouch. Yeah. Uh, so so that's, that's a good motivator. But that, I mean, that actually sounds in some ways like that sort of thing is a good motivator for you you know it's like anytime somebody says something can't be done um is that is that um you know born out of that sense of chippiness maybe the question there is how has that served you over your you know your life and and how has it hindered you over that period as well yeah i think you know obviously in in I think that when people who have met me in the vet sector and probably since would take a view that I would be come across as potentially confident, <laughs> uh, sometimes arrogant, yeah. uh, often difficult, um, and 
Uh, and and those are those are the flip sides of exactly the same thing. So I remember a friend asked me what what are my what am I how would I describe myself in three different phrases? And one is too much confidence. Second one was too little confidence, and the third one was too complicated. And <laughs> I think there are too many of us who have got into vet schools because we were alpha A grades yep. who have then struggled all the way through with you know that balancing of I'm good, but oh god, I'm terrible, but I'm good. And actually, um, it's I I think it's been an incredible driver for me, and it's really interesting. And we talked about the fact that we both live in the south of England now, and uh, we've got children who, you know, yours is, is Australian, stroke English, stroke right. Scottish. My my children are, uh, you know, little middle class English uh, kids who think that they're kind of Irish. And uh, but for me, they they won't have that same level. It's just their their upbringing, my upbringing, are so utterly different in terms of their their access to education their the environment in which they've grown up you know uh, coming from northern ireland inevitably you you saw bombings you you had people who were close to you that died in the troubles and they just i mean and, and I, i'm not wishing that upon them but it's been a major driver in me and also what what they have i think i'm hoping definitely got from me is my sense of uh of justice yeah. and meritocracy yeah. and i think that that's that's what's driven me and i get angry when i see that neither justice nor meritocracy are being applied and uh and i and, and that for me is is a fundamental trait do i live by those not necessarily <laughs> i do my best yeah. but uh, i think that's what happens it's um it's almost, you know, I think I just want to pick up on that description, which I think is, is, is going to resonate with a lot of people out there, you know, being super confident. It's like almost being the extrovert introvert yep. um, mix, which I think is something that is, you know, r- remarkably common. And one of the things that certainly I, I want to do with this podcast, you know, one of the reasons it's called Blunt Dissection is to be able to have topics that we can talk about that so we don't have taboo areas that so we don't label things as well that's a weakness or that's a strength you know because they're just parts of oh, entirely us. i agree with that you know in some ways it seems like you have the um uh you know you have had a career that is by any measure um has been successful in veterinary medicine and now you've got career 2.0 in the financial world and we'll come on to that but you've kind of gone places with that you know by harnessing that by riding that wave of you know the confidence side of things and being able to bridle or to cope or to have have strategies to deal with the you know maybe the little voice that says no you can't no you can't no you can't the the loud voice sort of one and there's there's people out there listening who maybe aren't business owners or have ambitions to do things who've who've gone the fully other way and let the negative voice win and you know and, and we know the cascade of bad things that can happen when people get in you know the the dark hole the yeah yeah, fall yeah. In. absolutely and it's almost like are, are we looking at chirals almost like you know the where we've got very similar makeups in our sort of veterinary dna as it were yes but with completely different outcomes um what do you have a sense of what are the decisions or the ways that you've coped with with being you, with living in your skin that have led to success where others might have gone down a different route? Yes. Um, listen, I think about this a lot because uh, that's, that's my too complicated piece. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think actually, I mean, it's, it's really interesting when you uh, stand, if you, for example, you just said to me, you know, by any measure it's a success. Actually, I I don't feel that by any stretch of the matches. I look at my career and I think that, in, in honesty, I've been spectacularly lucky. Um, I've been lucky in two ways. Timing, that really makes a big difference. Right. Second one was having people with me uh, on all of the journeys that were infinitely superior to me and who were able to support me in a variety of ways. And these are business partners, friends, family, whatever it is. Yeah. But um, uh, one question 
that, and I was speaking to somebody about this recently, they said, uh, and in fact, actually, I think you have a, a something you were, you were going to mention to me. What would you tell your 18-year-old self? Right. And in fact, my answer to that is, look, you are seriously mad. <laughs> and you've got to accept that. And you have to find coping strategies. Yep. And the coping strategies I've found are, because I'm an introvert, yep. and so are reading, cycling, yep. you know, health, and just knowing, knowing those flags for me that help me cope with things, um, help me burn off the stresses. Yep. Um, but, but I would say to my 18-year-old self, you are mad, but actually that is you, and you just need to harness that in the best way you can. Because without that, in fact, the things that you have done just weren't possible because you took too many risks, you were lucky, uh, some things didn't work out, fair enough. Yep. Um, you um, uh, recognized opportunities that others mightn't have done. You were confrontational and challenging with authority, which is possibly my Irish piece. And, um, and well, because well, of that... sounds. Very familiar. <laughs> Free police. I know. Familiar. I know. Um, and so by doing that, you just, you lucked out. But also, I, I've tried to treat the people who've treated me well, really well. Yeah. And, um, and try to forget the people who treated me badly. And that's it. Because it's too easy to dwell for somebody of my just completely obsessive, um, addictive personality. Yeah. There's a dark core that could eat you up and you've got to break out of that and just just focus on the good things. It sounds, it sounds trite, but what I'm trying to say is that A, I've worked hard. B, I've really been lucky. Yep. And if I, without various mechanisms of understanding myself and that self-awareness about how I can go downhill, uh, there's, there's no way I could have managed it. The, yeah. The self-awareness was the word that was just coming across yeah. blindingly clearly to me there. And another thing that you said that, that resonated was in conversations I've had with other people and certainly with coaches and mentors that I've had in discussions where I've been, you know, talking with, with, you know, through, uh, the challenges that I'm facing um, is that a a lot of the challenges we face are very similar, and b I think you're right. I think we all are in our own wonderful, glorious way, completely insane. Like yeah. in some ways, that's the human condition entirely, and and that it's okay that that's the case. It's not like you're different. It's not like you're on your own. It's just is, and it's about learning to embrace what your version of that crazy looks like, right? Yeah, give yourself a break. Give yourself a break, yeah. So do you, do you have any specific... Um, so let's say you, you recognize... Uh, let, let me give an example from me um, yesterday, uh, or two days ago. Um, I had a great day. Um, I had some really cool, exciting meetings with people. And then for some reason, I think the trigger for me, I was on Facebook and, you know, all those little things you see on Facebook, like someone else is getting like a bajillion likes on their thing or, oh my God, that, that dude's got my, my, loads more followers or, or, or just then you just get caught up on the noise and the, the sort of hate and the, you know, the labeling and the opinions. And for me, that's quite a trigger to become quite stressed. And I sort of recognized then that there's a lot of things happening, a lot of moving parts add in the fuel of the craziness and the, you know, the nonsense of Facebook. And I find myself getting to about nine o'clock at night and I was not capable of working anymore. I was working on a piece and I just find myself becoming really anxious. Yeah. And so recognizing that, and then I, you know, to me, that moment said, you know, the little voice in my head, instead of going, okay, go to the anxious place goes, switch your fucking computer off. <laughs> you, you, exactly. You're not doing anything more useful. You now just need to go and decompress and go nowhere near a computer for at least eight hours. And so I went to bed. I got up in the morning. I um, meditated for 15 minutes. I journaled the first thing that came in my head, which usually turned out to be my next blog, blog post. Yeah. Um, and then I felt completely energized in a different place. So it's just a matter of recognize the pattern apply the mechanism that brings you back from that place and then you're back on an even keel what mechanisms or you know how does that look for you yeah actually there are a few things there that you say that uh, i've learned firstly i many years ago deleted facebook <laughs> and uh in the past i think six months deleted twitter 
yeah. because of that. Yeah. I just can't. And in fact, also, I rarely watch... I, no, I mean, I am fully up to date with what's going on in the world, but I don't watch the news yeah. too much because it's it's overwhelming at times. Yeah. And so you've just got to learn... What are the things that, for me, I work... 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Yep. That's fine. It's uh, whatever. Um, and, I, and I know that I can do that if I have a certain number of, you know, exercise is sacrosanct for me. Yep. Um, sleep is incredibly important for me, even though I'm an insomniac. Um, so I look to get uh, my, my eight hours if I, I yep. can. It's not that I stay up late or whatever, yep. but I don't sleep and that's but i'm pretty okay with that yep and i avoid i try to avoid negativity there's enough negativity in the jobs that we do and in 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 dealing with stuff rather than imposing it upon yourself and uh, self yeah it's it's self-flagellation god you know yeah yeah it's tough let's not let's not do that and i actually i look at kids out and doing Facebook, Instagram stuff. And, and actually, it's that perpetual representation of this is what perfection looks like. This is what you should be aspiring to. This is what the good life is. Is it really? And then uh, I think that uh, just avoid that. Live, live your own yeah, path. It, is that the good life? And, and that's their painted, you know, like everyone's life suddenly appears like it has a filter on it. Yeah. No, entirely. Like, entirely. I, entirely. I, yeah, I think entirely. I, yeah, it's, it's sort of a, it's, and, and uh, you know, and, I, I, I'm, as, I'm as guilty of it as anybody, but it's a, a horrible medium. Um, and switching it off is, sounds like an it's the entirely best sensible thing to do. It sounds like we're going to need psychiatric treatment at the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> more, more psychiatric treatment. <laughs> <laughs> at the top of a very deep hole. Um, which probably suggests it's a sensible point to segue away from the, the, you know, the deep, the deep, yeah, the, the abyss. And move on to... Um, uh, you know the the it's like probably a good place to segue across is you know I, I was going to say the the area of your um, you know your big success within veterinary medicine, but I feel like prefacing that question with what what do you, how do you define success? <laughs> everyone has a their own definition, right? I don't think I've heard. You know, you've got the what people traditionally think of as success. But what does it mean to you? Uh, that's a... Uh, um, I think it's a sense... Well, there are, well actually, there are, there are a few elements. There's the internal, which is the sense of just general well-being and happiness with yourself. And that comes from... What, whatever you're doing at that time and that's like you're, you've moved up Maslow's hierarchy into the self-actualization right. room, where what you're doing is for your own benefit and excitement and intellectual stimulation and then the second bit is um, not being toxic to the people around you and, the, and those are the those are the two elements for me but in terms of is success I mean I you know success is something that maybe I, I will never achieve and I would, I would imagine, um, you know, given, you know, we're going to talk about pet doctors now and, and sort of by measures of, um, veterinary, um, and, and business success, then I think a lot of people would, would define that as such, um, simply if we're coming at it from, you know, a financial uh, and a business life cycle, you know, start up, build mature business and exit, um, so I'd love to just cover some of the some of the learnings from that process. That's probably the process that's most relevant to um, to the listeners on the hamster wheel. So, um, when you graduated from college, um, did you you know did you have ambitions to set up to build a large chain of practices, or you know what was in your head at that moment? And I, I'm slightly regretting asking that question. <laughs> Well, it's a long story, and and actually, it goes it's a back long form to podcast. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll be we might have any listeners. We'll be here for a while. <laughs> so we have. Um, l- let's go back to. I think it was my fifth or sixth year at Cambridge, and I was in a lecture, and that was a rare and wonderful occurrence up until that point. <laughs> but anyway, I was there. I was sitting beside a good friend of mine, Dave Hodges, who became my business partner at 
pet doctors who's still a very good friend of mine and that's an amazing journey in itself and he and i were listening to this canadian professor of pet psychology talking about um pet pet human bonds and this was 1990 89 90 so quite a long time ago and it's difficult for people who are graduating now to think back to really the shift that has happened in the urbanization of society with respect to pets and the and the shift from therefore from the thinking of agricultural pets or working animals to the to, right. to pets being an absolute integral common part of a family where they look after them and take them to the vet rather than throw them into the canal if they're <laughs> ill which Just, is you know you know poor industrial urban or rural life as as was yeah and and at the end of the lecture i turned around to dave and said my god i have seen the future of veterinary medicine and now i get it yeah i've got to set up a practice and he said to me i agree let's do it together and that was the very first time that we did that. We went out and had a coffee, or actually it wasn't really, was it coffee? Uh, we, we had beer, and we talked about it. And um, when we did, we, we, we had a similar vision, and it was really interesting. So when we graduated, we said to each other, let's go out, earn as much as we can, uh, you know, as new grads, you know, yep. nothing, um, <laughs> and save as much as we can, yep. and save up and buy a practice. And we, that was very much from the very first day. And so in the first two years, three years, four years even, I worked, uh, and as did Dave, uh, we worked long hours in our, and we worked in a couple of practices. We actually ended up working in a practice together in North London. So we worked long hours. I took How, how long were the hours? Well, I, I would do weekends working extra. Yeah. I would take two weeks holiday a year and for the rest of the time I would work in the practice and they would pay me locum rates. Right. I worked some nights at Elizabeth Street, uh, which was the only all-night hospital uh, down in, uh, in Belgravia. Yep. Um, and uh, I just did anything I could to get money and I saved it all. And paid off my student debts, yep. which obviously weren't anything compared to the student debts people have today. Yes. Um, and what 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 was the number there? And I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, how, what was the level of student debt? So 1990. Was, well, I mean, for me, it was just a few thousand pounds. Yeah. But I mean, that was considered. Uh, I mean, given my the fact, that I think I had grant a student grant back yep. in the time and yep. everything like that. So that was a, it. Was quite a large yep. large amount of money. Okay. Um, and so I had to pay that down. I think my starting salary was twelve thousand pounds or eleven thousand pounds back yeah. in early. It strikes me that one of the strengths that you have is you see the change that's coming before it's actually upon the market. You know, to be able to spot in that lecture back in Cambridge the the change in the relationship and then to follow that through to be able to execute a strategy that then places the customer at the center of a business and removes that sort of relationship now like that sort of you know that's that's a, a, a sort of a trite thing now like every, that's yeah. that's just what's done but then that would have been something quite different yeah but actually now that there is a there's a continued shift and and uh, you know, uh, in my now financial world, we have a business, and I'm, I won't bother mentioning it, but we have a business that I think I'm seeing the next shift. So if you look at what the consumers are looking for now, be it, uh, you know, right across the demographic, um, they are looking for value for money. And they are looking for accessibility. They're looking for the next stage in what a consumer wants. So they want to be able to go to places when it's convenient to them. They want to pay prices that they think are great value. Yep. They want to be treated incredibly well while doing it. And you see the rise of the Lidls and the Aldis as an exact exa example of that. You go into uh, the store or the car park of, of one of the German discounters yep. and you'll see a BMW 5 Series and you'll see a 1973, uh, you know, uh, Datsun Sunny parked yep. together with people going and saying, I want to not pay for stuff above and beyond the price that is reasonable. So that's an interesting 
It's an interesting comparison for two things. One, I um, I ended up in a car park in the little, <laughs> in my, you know, middle-aged man sort of, you know, BMW car, which I said I would never, ever have, um, uh, next to, you know, uh, uh, probably a Datsun or something like that. And I went in and I'm always very conscious and, you know, my, my radar, my antenna has always switched on to the value offering in any business yep. that you're in, which is really lousy if you're just trying to enjoy an experience at a restaurant or something you just don't switch that off and my sense was of you know there's there's very you know so there's no frills it's a no frill service same with you know an airline service like easyjet or something like that um are we entering the age and is this the start of the end uh, and i'm going to ask that provocatively um not not as a a smart ass sort of thing. The end of, um, or the start of the end where veterinary medicine has now reached its point of maturity where we're commodity, we've, we've become commoditized. And if that's true, looking at markets, the downward, you know, the, the inevitable effect in any market that where the thing has become you know, widely commoditized is the downward pressure on price. What does that, trend look like if indeed that is a trend what does that look like for the future of veterinary medicine like is it is the current model sustainable if that's the trend if if people want higher and higher service for lower and lower or or maintain service for lower and lower price where do we find the fat in an industry that is you know classically bad at managing its resources its time yeah its people things like that that's, that's a really interesting question. I don't, I'll tell you where I see the pressure is going to come from. And in fact, uh, dropped onto my uh, doormat this morning was the RCVS telemedicine um, you yep. know, newsletter. Um, it, telemedicine is interesting. So uh, everybody says it can't really translate into uh, the vet sector or can it? Um, you know, and there's a lot of debate about this. I look at a business like uh, Babylon, uh, which is a human um, uh, telemedicine business, let's call it that. Yep. So it's an app. Yep. And you can get access to GP consultations or specialist consultations. You can pay a monthly fee or you can pay a one-off fee to access a GP um, through uh, uh, like FaceTime or yep. Skype or whatever it is on the app. Yep. Completely uh, secure, so they say. They've raised 40 odd million dollars of funding, UK based. But what's really interesting is that that $40 million isn't going to building a silly little app. It's going into artificial intelligence. Yeah. And in fact, they have won the contracts to provide the 111 service in uh, a lot of London. And what does that mean? It means basically you can go on to the, the Babylon 111 service and you can follow an algorithm that creates... Um, a pathway for them to say to you, you have got something that needs to be seen by 999 right. Right. or you need to see your GP or you need to go to your pharmacist and get some, you know, pain gel or whatever it is. Yeah. And what's really very important there is that the success of artificial intelligence or automated intelligence, and there's a slight difference between the two, is that they are predicated on data sets. So Babylon gives itself an immediate head start by capturing lots and lots of data. Yep. And so the first veterinary module that actually is able to do that and start capturing people putting in data about their pets that then translates into um, a, an efficiency through the algorithm, then actually you start cutting out a lot of the human resource yep. and that's the fear and everybody it's in it, it, there's a lot of debate about the world of productivity and what future work looks like and how and how i mean bill gates came out recently and said that there should be a tax uh, on robots hmm. and the basis being that every time a robot is created uh then actually a job is lost or 20 jobs are lost right. And, and of course, when that is done, then there's a reskilling, there's support, whatever it is for those individuals. It's not a great idea because actually what is a robot when you, um, when you book your flight with Ryanair, 
that's a person that you replaced. That's your travel agent. Yes. You know, are you going to pay for that a yep. tax on the, on that robot? Yep. Or if you go along to your petrol station and pump some petrol into your really quite nice BMW that you parked outside, uh, you middle aged man, uh, then uh, you pumping it yourself out of an automated machine is yep. that machine the robot rather than some guy with a handle? Yep. So, but in the in the context of veterinary medicine, I think uh, technology is is will have within the next 10 years, a massive uh, part to play. And I think also that within the context, again, of any industry, if you go to the classic, you know, uh, uh, model of industries about Porter's Five Forces, either you've got to be low cost or premium. Yep. And those in between tend to get mauled. Not necessarily. I mean, what is it? Are there, is, is the premium about its locality? It's about service. It's about not necessarily about pricing. It's about uh, convenience access. Whatever it is, yeah. you've got to set yourself as a differentiator because it's an increasingly, I mean, a commoditized market. Correct. Uh, you can see chains in the UK that have got three, four, five hundred practices. Yeah. Um, some of them are branded. Some of them are not branded. But there is pressure on the market without any shadow of a doubt. And that's not necessarily a good thing. And, and it's actually, yeah. it's, it's, it's an interesting because it's, a, it, you know, it's, uh, look, I, I, <laughs> I've clearly 100% benefited from the changes that have come through, um, as have pet owners. Let's yep. be really 100% clear. They have benefited massively from our shift from this ridiculous system we had before to a much more open, challenging, questioning rather than hierarchical system that we have today. Yep. Um, and, but at the same time, I look at the, the young vets who are coming out and I look at their careers and I look at what they're getting paid and I look at what they're doing. And I look at themselves, their, their, their sense of not feeling able to do the work that I was able to do and you're able to do. Like it's, you know, it's not quite the see one, do one, teach one, but it was certainly see a few, yeah. get your book open beside the operating theater and give it right. a damn good go because right. the, 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 the pet owner knew that this was the best you would be able to do. And there wasn't a referral center within 300 or 400 miles outside a university. And so... That's gone. What, what, what is it? Is it a life of vaccination on low pay? I mean, is that really what we're asking these youngsters to spend five years at university, racking up 100 grand of debt, coming out to a mid-20s, whatever it is, £1,000 a year income, where, well, you know, she's below hull. You can't afford to buy a, a one-bedroom flat. It's, it's an insanity. It, 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 but I don't have the answer. No, and it seems um, that I wonder if the job will even exist. And and I I would have said twenty years, but you know if, if you heard the sort of the second half of the board theory, where uh, I think the old Chinese proverb is that you know the there's a a, a pauper bets the the emperor. Um, it basically bets him and his bet is like if I solve and I forget the exact riddle so I'm going to yeah. massacre it here but basically if he solves a problem he wants his payment in the form of a grain of rice that doubles for every board oh yeah checkerboard yeah and of course he bankrupts the kingdom and yeah all, the king can no way afford it but the the big doublings all happen in that second half of the checkerboard very the much checkerboard. so and and certainly this looks back to I think Moore's law that says yeah know, something doubles in process or power and halves in price every 18 months or something like that yeah. but if you look back to when compu computers first appeared well we're now entering that second half of the board and so technological advances are probably going to come at us now that are you know inconceivable like what we see in a decade before we'll see compressed you know this compression of time effect coming down more and more and so the ability for robots to do surgery based on you know, real-time CT or something like that. Um, you know, we already have remote robots that perform microsurgery on battlefields with surgeons who sit in a, yes. an office someplace else. We already have the technologies. It's just a matter of the processing powers to join these things up, which are happening very rapidly. You know, we're painting a really bleak sort of future. But it is a concern, is it not, for graduates now? Like if my, my daughter's four now, if she wanted to become a vet, like I'm not even convinced that that as a role will exist. Now, my 
you know that that none of us can stop or change that that's a that something's happening we have to adapt to as a profession um i guess my question from a business perspective is how do we win is it about who retains the, the ownership of the customer is that why we're seeing um, businesses like mars core buying uh, vca in the us and combining vca and banfield to become really a sort of small percentage holder of the market but massive like a, a maybe a first yeah. mega player is that what's happening as a, as a mega trend uh, you know as a big macro in our industry is it about now okay the wave's coming like te- technology uh, social change all of these things are coming is it now about who owns and maintains a relationship of the, with the customer something that's been chipped away at in veterinary medicine for a period of time with the fragmentation and you know the paraprofessional services um, and and indeed us losing our place of relevance because of our inability really to grasp even something simple like how we communicate on the internet. How do we as an industry, or can we as an industry, maintain that relationship? And is that relationship the thing that's going to be key for whoever dominates in the future? That's kind of a <laughs> monster big Wow, question. yes. Well... I think there are a few elements to that. One is I actually am less pessimistic about the role of vets and how they will how, how they will continue to pr- exist. Yep. And what, what makes you less pessimistic? Because whilst I see algorithms and and you know robotic technology playing a massive part, there is still going to be in in human and pet medicine the absolute role of the empathetic, emotional. Um, uh, n- non-algorithmic individual that can help somebody make decisions um, that are pertinent to them. Will, I think, I- i.e., will we ever as humans be able to trust Skynet? Or <laughs> no, no, yeah, no, the indeed, the, indeed, uh, we won't. Human. The answer is we won't. <laughs> right. <laughs> the second thing is how do we how do vets? And it's interesting because. You know, I, I just use the word "we," and so I sit. I sit with a very uh, fractured personality here. One is, you know, I was a vet, and it's been incredibly important to me. Yep. Second thing is, um, I uh, sit as a financier yep. uh, who invests in the sector, and uh, and I look at what are my options for financial returns, and that's important. Um, but that comes upon building a, a really good business model. Yep. But as as vets, and if vets want to have a better say in how uh, the vet profession or the pet sector exists, they can't be relying on the RCVS. They can't be relying on BSAVA or BVA. The only way that they can actually deliver this is having career paths that lead to senior executive positions in corporate entities because the corporate market at the moment is about 30% consolidated in the UK. Recently, I mean, I was at a presentation a week or two ago and PwC were predicting 70% consolidation within the next five to 10 years. That's a lot of consolidation still to run. And that's why there are so many. I went along to one of the, I think it was London Vet Show recently. And I walked through the place and it was, you know, it was a very surreal experience. I saw a bunch of people I haven't seen in many years who just looked slightly older, but I was thinking I'm obviously much younger than you now. <laughs> and, uh, but actually it was like walking through the, uh, uh, private equity convention. I yeah. bumped into so many colleagues from my sector who were there s- scouting out opportunities. It mm-hmm. was remarkable. Um, so consolidation will continue. There will be new entrants to the market. Yeah. The current entrants may further consolidate or the current players may further consolidate. Th- that's just what is going to happen. The question is then, who is leading these organizations? What decisions are they making about the future of their staff? And, you know, there is something to be said. You know, you and I have both worked in practices, and we've talked about your, your uh, work and leadership. We've worked in practices where the people at the top of the practices are really toxic. Mm. You know, just, right. just th- there's nothing there. Yep. Um, surely a good company 
will develop the talent management that allows people who want to grow in terms of leadership roles or managerial roles, whatever it is, to be given the training to allow them to do that properly. There was a, uh, the, um, I think it's the Institute of Fiscal Studies uh, uh, did something on productivity, report on productivity uh, today. And uh, the thrust of their argument is that managerial competence in the UK is appalling and people are appointed to management because they've been pretty good at a technical role. Right. And, you know, how many times have we seen that in veterinary practices? And listen, I'm very much a product of that. I work with people who, uh, the chief executive of one of my companies has had amazing leadership training and wow i I listen to her and i i see what she does and it's so far above and beyond my capability that i and i I mean it's spectacular and i love it um but i then reflect upon my (laughs) complete and utter gaps in ability and the way i've managed things in the past and and how much better i might have been (laughs) if i'd had some training rather than winging it and learning from disastrous mistakes it's the classic um, you know, somebody's technically good at something, so then we give them a job with zero training, and so we stuff up their ability to do the thing they were technically good at, and then they're not through any malice. I think I clearly remember my first role as a as a manager, and you're just thrashing around for a role model, and and often that role model comes in the form of behaviour you've witnessed elsewhere in the industry so your first bosses and yep. um and and also then if you look around at other role models we have you pretty quickly arrive at in the world of entertainments at movies uh, or shows and so the the model for leadership certainly that i was presented by scottish uh kind of not not terribly strict but you know disciplinary sort yes. of father um with bosses who are sort of alpha male um, characters, and then through the Hollywood model uh, of you know the the hero, the central character gets the you know kills the baddie, gets the girl, and saves the entire planet all on their own, and then you wonder, uh, so why is it that we have people who are collapsing under pressure and yes. also toxifying their teams yeah. around them when that's you know that's the sort of version, the hierarchical. Um, patriarchal you're the center of the hub style version of leadership why do you think we're still struggling with that you know the whole you know notion of leadership as a as a principle there's a sense that once you move into a leadership role you have to present yourself in a certain way and and therefore it has to be i'm tough you know this is male or female i'm tough i i'm in control I am omniscient, you know, I will, you know, you throw anything at me, I will take it. But in fact, this is just not the case. We're not like that. We're not human beings that, that are able to deal with that. Or, or, or if we are, then we're so arrogant and stupid and la- lack that self-awareness or understanding of the in- environment in which we're working that yep. we're going to fail. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would actually, there's another point I, I would, and this is maybe where the vet profession has got a real opportunity we here we are to dare i say graying men <laughs> certainly i am gray graying men what, what i have think they're little boys really <laughs> yeah <are>. exactly <laughs> in our in our trainers and t-shirts right. <laughs> and um but the vast majority of the profession is female yep and i remember there was a professor of uh um entrepreneurship at the rbc uh, a few years ago from ireland um colette Gosh, her name, her surname has escaped me. But she wrote a fantastic article about women need to step up to leadership. And I think that is that actually changes things quite significantly. So, you know, I have a, I have a business in, in the vet sector uh, called The Vet. We had the team in, the executive team in yesterday to present to my uh, uh, group of colleagues. And there were four from The Vet the chairman, the chief executive, and the COO were women. And the, the CFO, who's recent, is the only bloke there. Yep. And that's a repre- And none of them are vets. One is a vet nurse. But that's a representation of what we have to be doing and setting role models um, for women 
in the sector and saying, look, yes, uh, career breaks are fine, but please don't be scared to come back into the profession and right. please don't feel that and, 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 and create the environment where it isn't a sense that I've taken time out, therefore I can't come back. Or if I want to come back in a part-time capacity, that makes me a lesser person or whatever it is. Only what I think 11% of uh, 11% of vets work part-time yeah. and 90% of them are women. And you think, hang on. Where's that? Where's all that resource? Yep. Where's all that talent? Where's what, what? What are we losing by creating an environment where that's not considered to be the right thing to do? And there has to be different models of working that allows that to happen, and for then that different attitude uh, to filter through into the leadership roles in the in the businesses. And it doesn't have to be I am the hard assed uh, whatever. Uh, it can be a m- much more nuanced professional, supportive, coaching, mentoring yep. situation that allows everybody to bring out the best in themselves. Yep. And that should happen, you know, through the testosterone-driven sector of finance, through through uh, the vet sector, through... I mean, I, I see this in hospitals all the time as yep. well. I do a lot of work in healthcare, yep. and I see just an absolute testosterone-driven attitude of the hierarchical bullying yeah that's got we've got to move away from those structures absolutely and it is it is very ref- refreshing i had the um the pleasure of speaking um with your management team and great to hear their ideas and to see um powerful women driving an organization that's doing something different um great to see uh, gudrun at bva you know a, a, a lady at the the top of that organization as well. Um, are we at a tipping point? Are we at the point where this is now starting to filter through, particularly with the sale of a lot of practices and you know, with that trend moving from, you say 30% right now in the UK corporatization up to 70%, you know, most of the people who own practices are middle-aged men. Um, is this the tipping point? Is this the time at which we see that crossover starting to happen? Um, interestingly, one of the comments that, that um that Jess made was that it's it's actually a struggle to get men into a veterinary organization yep. now. And so there's there's just this extreme asymmetry at the minute between the bosses who own and then who's working. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens next, is it not, whereby there are fewer and fewer men. And I'm not saying that's a, a bad thing, but you're going to have this complete asymmetry throughout um and how that's going to affect yeah change. well it's actually it's really important because the, the, it, and, it, I, and i'm really conscious of us being two you know blokes having this conversation but that's what we are so yeah yeah that, no, entirely. We, we, and we can't avoid it so no. when you look what are the issues again about feminization of any profession and there are uh, uh two two major major problems one is pay goes down Right, and that's the data supports that. Yep. So there's no. So if you look at um, at teaching, if you look at uh, law in the UK now, pay has been driven down by feminisation. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, well, I mean it's complex, but a part of it is that women have not been able to push as hard as men in asking for that, and that's a cultural uh, issue that starts with the starts with the, the the pink versus blue, the doll versus car, um, and that has to be unwound. And look, you and I both the, have daughters. The Disney conditioning. Yeah, exactly, that's being it. Being reliant on the prince rescuing. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I I, I, I... I mean... It's quite why I like the Frozen film, actually, because it's two strong female characters. Yeah, no, that entirely. Through. Well, like, here, here's, a, here's, a, here's an interesting story. This is me, actually... This is, this is probably one of the highlights of my vet career, I'm going to tell you now. Um, so I, I, have, I have a practice, uh, sorry, at Pet Doctors, I had a practice. And the, uh, the vet uh, was a really successful practice. And the vet was uh, a lesbian. Uh, one day I came into the practice and she said to me, Garrett, um, I was speaking at the teenage LBGT, uh, uh, you know, club last night and i was talking about pet doctors and basically saying they were a 
a classic example of a great employer for L- the LBGT community. Fantastic. I said, oh, yes, that's, that's really, no, it's really, I find that really flattering. Thank you very much. I don't understand why. <laughs> and she said, well, it's very simple. You employed me. I look slightly different. And you employed me. You know that I'm a lesbian. Um, you, you don't care. Uh, you pay me uh, quite well. And, and what I know is this. If I perform for you, you will pay, for more, pay me more. If I don't perform for you, you will fire me. <laughs> he said, you do not care what I am. It is of no consequence to you. You look yep. at me and all you see is a productive unit <laughs> and you will promote or demote me based upon how, how good I am and nothing yep. else. And I think that's a really important thing for everybody. Or, look, I'm, I know I'm talking, you know, smoke up my own ass here, but this is, the point is, and it goes back to my meritocratic principles, as, you know, we'll call them. Look, yep. if you're doing the job, I do not give a hoot whether you're, Anything. Yeah. Look, and I come from a, 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 a country and a childhood where if you wore a certain tie or had a certain surname or went to a certain school, you could not get a job in the fire brigade. Yep. You could not get a job in the civil service. Yep. Whereas you could get a job in the GAA or whatever it was or in the local Newry Council because, yes. you know, so that I loathe yep. and I want everybody to have the chance to either take it or balls it up. Yep. I don't care, but I'm giving you the chance. But Not all of you will make it, and that's fine, but yep. take, take it on and, 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 and work with it. And that's where, actually, um, male or female, but particularly given that we're now a female-dominated profession, yep. women have to step up to the leadership roles and say, you know what, I am actually bloody good enough, and I'm prepared to take this on, and I am a leader, and I don't care whether there's some kind of stereotypical male executive or divisional commander or clinical director or whatever it is, and I don't care who, you know, what, whether it's I'm in charge of 15 men or 15 women, I am a leader, and I'm going to prove it um, in a non-toxic way. And, and, and create a new set of rules, you know, yes. not follow the stereotypical male testosterone driven model yes which just hasn't served us very well so far um okay so let's uh, i want to be um respectful and conscious of your time and so i'm going to um i can keep talking about this stuff for ages and um I'm, i might twist your arm to come back another. <laughs> now i obviously will bring wine or beer next yeah time. that that i, I yeah Please. Well, let's make it later in the afternoon. Yeah, right, right. Probably not. (laughs) Half 10 in the morning start. Um, So I'm going to hit some more rapid fire style questions. And you you can answer them. They don't have to be short answers. They can be whatever you like. Um, But uh, so I'll fire into these. And and we won't do all of them because there's a few to choose from. But I'll just choose the ones I think might might give the most interesting or amusing (laughs) answers. What's the thing that you do better than anyone else? Your your superpower. You know, you've sort of mentioned, you know, um, a few things as we've gone through there, but I'm interested in, you know, what what is it that has brought you on the journey and given you the opportunities you've had? Um, I, I look, I don't, I don't have any. I tell you that the few things I see as my character traits: uh, resilience and hard work. That's it nothing and and i mean if the, if the third one it's always to surround myself with people who are infinitely superior to me and i have done that from from the very very start yeah. absolutely and that's the key um what's your kryptonite and how have you addressed that the kryptonite being the thing that can destroy me yeah uh it is well, I mean, crikey, there are, I've got boxes of them. I suppose it's, uh, I would say that it, it's the yin, yin and yang thing. It's, it's the insecurity that drives me is also the thing that can bring me down. Yeah. So I'm very, very aware of that. I would say also that because I'm, I'm so 
I'm, it's interesting. I, I don't see myself as ambitious. I'm yeah. not ambitious, yeah. uh, uh, but I am driven. And, I, and, and, and there's a differentiation in my mind about that. I am not... I am driven to be really, really the best I can possibly be at whatever I am doing. I am not ambitious to progress, right. to, to, to be in charge of stuff, to lead stuff. That isn't what, that isn't what interests me. This, this is our this self-actualization bit. Yep. I am desperate to continue to prove to myself and to the people around me that I can do it. In fact, the chippiness. Yeah, just never ending. <laughs> um. Thinking of productivity, do you have any favorite um, tools or apps or things that you use that serve you really well and help you manage time or money or... Um well, listen, I think I, I mentioned, actually, it's quite the flip side of that. The, the biggest productivity gain that I made was deleting social media apps from my phone and iPad. And I, yep. I, I, I commute and I travel a lot uh, around the, the UK. And so I spend a lot of time on iPads. Uh, and you can waste that time just by checking your Twitter feed, checking your Facebook feed, seeing if somebody on Facebook has mentioned what was on Twitter and vice versa. So deleting those and then just focusing on either work, yep. which is great, yep. or actually stuff that I really love, yep. such as reading or learning a language. Yep. That's, I, that's my productivity tip. Can you put an hours per week that you save by not doing those things? Oh, Have you ever tried to calculate how much time you save by... Well, you know, actually, interestingly, because um, the one social media thing I'm on, if you call it that, is LinkedIn. Yeah. And recently, I suddenly thought, how, how long am I spending reading crappy news articles and stuff on this? <laughs> Too long. Why, why is Dave publishing that? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that every, every time. <laughs> read it every time. <laughs> Delete. And, um, but I deleted it from my phone, and I left it on my iPad, and I've closed it down on my desktop. And so I go to yep. it. Very, very, very occasionally. And that probably saves me five hours a week in itself, to be honest. <laughs> um, I'm obsessive. That's the problem. Oh, um, so this question, you probably, I probably have to rework it now then, since you, you've, you've categorically dismantled Twitter off of your phone. Um, but should you reinstall it and were you to send one tweet and you, you know, that was the, the last tweet you ever got, but the whole world got to see this tweet and would read it. What would you say? I would say, oh gosh, I don't know. You're up to about 30, 30 characters already. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got two children. I look yep. at them and I look at the world and I, fear for what we're doing to it i would probably say something a lot i mean i know this sounds incredibly sentimentalist but i would say let's remember that it's a finite resource yeah kids make you reflect i was going to say reflect on the future but they certainly make you cons- <laughs> it's <just> ridiculous <laughs> but they certainly make you circular yes that. exactly yeah definitely um are, are there are any books that have been particularly helpful to you or that you go back to again and again um, for advice, for wisdom, for guidance? Um, or any you would recommend any practice owners or want-to-be leaders would so, get their hands on? Yeah, when, when we were going through... Look, there are lots of books on leadership out there, and a lot of them I'm entirely skeptical. <laughs> I think the data that supports them is absolute n- nonsense. Um, I think that, um, there is a writer who's a, you know, modern day philosopher, Alan de Botton, Hmm. and he wrote a book called, uh, gosh, what was it called? Success Envy or something like that. And that was a really important book for me because I come from my university. So go back. You said, you said to me, you look successful. Yeah. a lot of my friends from university who aren't vets, who were doing other subjects at, at Cambridge, the level of success they have achieved is spectacular. Chief executive of major FTSE 100 organizations yes. or massively successful entrepreneurs, whatever it is. And I look at them and I benchmark it. When I say benchmark, I look at them and go, wow, that's incredible. That is really yep. successful. Of course, I know them and I know that they're going, 
my lord, life's hard and this and that and the other. They live, they're human beings, they have the yep. same hassles with yep. their, their, their husbands or their wives or their families or their commute right. or whatever it is that we do. Right. Um, but uh, reading that book, actually at one point, at a particular point in my life, where I think I was looking to other people to benchmark myself, yep. brought me back to understand that, in fact, the happiness I got was from other things, uh, be it you know, listening to music or going for a walk or going on my bike. And actually, I had to be happy within that. Otherwise, I was just going to become just this molten lava bilious, miserable shit that, that many people would say that I probably am anyway. <laughs> Particularly after listening to this podcast. <laughs> I might open a beer. <laughs> the sun is technically over the yard arm now, so I wouldn't judge you. Um, what was the best piece of advice that you have ever received? And who gave you it? Um, that... Actually, I think that, and this is a strange one, I think I was two, a year and a half qualified, maybe even less actually as a vet. And I was working in London. I thought I was amazing, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I went out for a beer with the guy who was the vet senior to me, um, who I haven't heard of, but his name, Stephen Pritchard, Scottish guy. And he went out for a beer, sunny day in West London. And we were sitting there and he said, Garrett, you know, you know, you're a really nice guy. And I thought, yeah, yeah, I am. I am just fantastic. He said, but you really are an arrogant shit. <laughs> and actually, I was shocked. <laughs> and it was terrifying that I should be shocked. But I was shocked. And so I know that, and I, you'll hear me say this, I come across very often as arrogant and i don't really i honestly don't believe that i am but i i can come across that but that really did get me thinking about how other people saw me for the very first time and started me off just trying to be create that level of understanding about both how people saw me how i saw myself and actually how that influenced what i did and how i could adjust both to make the outcomes better for everybody it's um interesting that that is certainly echoes something that my last podcast guest Diedrich was also told by a client <laughs> really and uh, I think he asked the client for feedback and um and the, the client said you, you know you're a great vet but you're a shit of a boss yeah <laughs> and that was his sort of you know you know his self-awareness cherry was yeah. sort of popped at that moment um what was the worst piece of advice you've ever received or indeed given. Oh. Oh, I've given some bad <laughs> advice. Actually, there's one terrible piece of advice I gave to somebody. <laughs> so I had... Oh, this is funny. I mean, in a kind of look very bad way. Um, so uh, I was introduced... Oh, no, I spoke at an event for London Business School, um, uh, private equity, uh, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, one of the audience members who was a, an investment banker, a young girl, you know, in her late 20s, I suppose, from Kazakhstan, of all places, uh, was speaking to me. And we had a coffee. She came to the office. We had a coffee. And she said, look, uh, you know, I'm doing investment banking. I'm working all these hours. And, you know, investment bankers work spectacularly hard. And uh, I'm doing all these hours and, you know, I just, I'm not really that into it and stuff like that. And I need to, you know, what I said, look, and this was my bad piece of advice. You've got to follow what you love. <laughs> so she went, you know, you're absolutely, this is inspiration. You're absolutely right. So she quit her investment banking job. Yeah. The problem was, and she hadn't thought this through, was her visa was attached to that job. <laughs> oh, God. And she had to go back to Kazakhstan. <laughs> And so we have this little, in, 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 in our office, this little vision of her w opening a bakery in Kazakhstan um, because that is all that she now has. So that was, when people say follow what you love, that, it has an element to it, but actually you've got to do it in a really practical way that doesn't completely shambalize your life. But do think it through first. Think it through first. Follow what you love. <laughs> you know, yeah. asterisks. Asterisk. Please see footnotes. Terms and conditions apply. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're we're pushing on time um so i'm gonna i think that's probably a a good place to to end 
round one. There's so much actually on this list that I would have loved to talk to you about. I think it would be f- the relationships that you have built around you and that they've stood the test of time. Love to chat to you about that a little more. Yeah, it's it's absolutely. It's a huge thing. So I'd like to say, I mean, do. as you can see that my egomaniac side <laughs> takes over and I'm, I can spend days talking about myself. <laughs> Well, it's no, it's been fascinating speaking with you. Uh, super appreciative of the time. And um, thank you very much, Garrett, for having me out. And thank you to everybody for listening. I hope you found that uh, useful, entertaining, enjoyable. And I uh, look forward to seeing you on the next podcast. Just a quick message from me. Uh, Today was the first show we did where we ran a sponsor ad at the start. Sponsor ads are what make things like this possible. So if you do enjoy the content, uh, please visit the site. And I will only bring sponsor ads to you that sell products that I endorse fully or use myself. So uh, don't forget to check out the sponsors. And... Also, if you like the content, then please, you might find something more that you like across at the Hamster Wheel blog. Uh, You can go to drdavenickel.com forward slash hamster wheel, or you can jump on Facebook and you can like my page, which is found at drdavenickel. So that's facebook.com forward slash drdavenickel. Until next time, be well, be safe, be happy, and please have an awesome month. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next show.